I find the fulfillment of prophecies amazing. When you look back in history, you see that the precision of God's word. In Revelation 11, you will discover another amazing fulfillment of prophecy. Listen carefully as Francois draws the curtain on this interesting chapter. In our previous lecture on Revelation chapter 10, we studied about the angel who stood on the land and the sea. We've identified him as Christ. He had an open book in his hand and invited John to come and eat the book. And then we made the amazing discovery that the Michael of Daniel 12, who appeared to Daniel, and the angel of Revelation 10 are one and the same person, Jesus Christ. He told Daniel to seal the book until the time of the end, and now John sees the opening of the sealed book of Daniel. From our study of Daniel 12, we discovered that the time of the end began in 1798 when the 1260-year prophecy was fulfilled. Revelation chapter 10 verses 8 and 9 Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. These early Adventists, who belonged to all the mainland churches, thought Jesus would come in 1844 at the end of the 2,300-year prophecy. But this sweet expectation ended in a bitter disappointment. What were they to do? They had made fools of themselves. The churches of the world mocked at them. Where did they go wrong? But God had a purpose in allowing these students of prophecy to be humiliated. There was a great work to be done and he was purging and preparing them for their future task. Revelation chapter 10 verse 11 Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, languages and kings. And this is exactly what these early Adventists did. They re-studied the prophecy of the 2,300 years as well as the work of Christ in the Most Holy. And they made the solemn discovery that the great investigative judgment began in heaven in 1844. Suddenly the sealed prophecies of Daniel were unsealed and they understood its messages. John saw in vision that the proclamation of the everlasting gospel coupled with the serious Judgment Hour message, would be proclaimed on a global scale. In a later lecture, we will be looking at the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy. Let's turn our attention to Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. What would you say? Is this a literal measuring of the literal temple in Jerusalem? No. Why not? Because at the time John wrote the book of Revelation, Jerusalem was in ruins. So this measuring, this judgment, has to do with spiritual Jerusalem with the professed children of God. This introduction takes our minds immediately to the most holy place where Christ not only intercedes for us, but where he is presiding in the investigative judgment. Do you still remember when it began? 1844. We studied about the work of the little horn and the 2,300 days in Daniel 7, 8 and 9. Let's just refresh our minds with the opening scenes of the great investigative judgment. Daniel 7 verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of the Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. Verse 10. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Whose books are these? Yours? And mine. Tell me, what is written in your books? Do you think you stand a chance of being saved when the heavenly court investigates your sinful life record? 
I want to tell you that according to my record, I do not stand a chance to be saved. Is there any hope for sinners like you and me? Yes, Jesus brings that hope. Verse 13, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. What a message of hope! Thank God, Jesus is our advocate. If I have confessed my sins, he pleads my case. And he has never yet lost one court case on behalf of repentant sinners. There is only one thing he cannot handle, and that is unconfessed sins. If there is something that you ought to set right and confess, please don't procrastinate. We are living in the serious time of the investigative judgment. John the Revelator takes his imagery of measuring Jerusalem from Zechariah chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. Let me read you something comforting from verse 5. It says, And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. If I maintain a meaningful relationship with Christ my Lord, judgment will be announced in favor of me. I need the Lord to be that wall of fire around me, and I need him to be the glory within me, as we've read in Zechariah. There is a very dangerous theology which says, once saved, always saved. A theology that could make you indifferent to life and holiness. Let me share with you something that really made me think. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshippers thereof. Remember when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. Remember that your words and actions are being photographed in the books of heaven as the face is reproduced by the artist on the polished plate. Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count the worshippers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for forty-two months. Who are the people of the outer court? In the ancient temple at Jerusalem, there were two kinds of worshippers. The genuine Jews were allowed to worship inside the inner court, but the heathen people could only worship in the outer court. And this is what John sees in vision. The cases of all professed Christians will appear in judgment, but only those who have confessed their sins will be saved. The others will be excluded. The Greek word is ekbalu, means thrown out. They will be disqualified for heavenly citizenship. Let's read more about this interesting subject. Revelation 11, 2 says, But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Who are the Gentiles who would trample on the holy city for 42 prophetic months or 1,260 literal years? The prophecies of Daniel tell us that they are the professed Christians who persecuted God's sincere followers from 538 to 1798. Besides persecuting every person who believed in salvation by grace, the medieval church also waged a war against the Bible, the only standard for truth. Both the Old and the New Testaments are witnesses of the eternal truth of God. The Council of Toulouse, which met about the time of the crusade against the Albigenses, ruled. We prohibit laymen possessing copies of the Old and New Testament. We forbid them most severely to have the above books in the popular vernacular. The lords of the districts shall carefully seek out the heretics in dwellings, hovels and forests, and even their underground retreats shall be entirely wiped out. I visited some of the strongholds of the Albigenses. During one campaign, Pope Innocent III, with the help of the King of France, 
massacred more than one million Albigenses. What happened to God's two witnesses during the 1260 years of persecution? Did Rome manage to destroy God's word, his witnesses? No, it is impossible. His word is just as indestructible as he himself is. Revelation chapter 11 verses 3 to 5 And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. The two witnesses are also called what? Two olive trees and two lampstands. How do I know that the two witnesses are the word of God? Let's go to the Old Testament and look for the meaning of the two lampstands and the two olive trees. Zechariah chapter 4 verses 3 to 6 Also there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. According to Zechariah, the two lampstands and the two olive trees are the word of God. Revelation 11 calls the two lampstands and the two olive trees the two witnesses. But we have a still clearer description in Zechariah chapter 4. Verses 11 to 14. Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. What a beautiful description of the word of God. The oil from the olive trees supplies the fuel for the lampstand to burn. The oil represents what? The Holy Spirit that enlightens our understanding of the Bible. Psalms 119 verse 105 Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Never study the Bible without first asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten your mind. By the way, there is no other book that develops the human mind as does the Bible. While we compare scripture with scripture, this marvelous book becomes alive. John 5 verse 39 You diligently search the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So Jesus calls the Old Testament a witness. What about the New Testament? Matthew 24 verse 14 And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony, a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Like the Old Testament, the New Testament is also called a witness. Revelation 11 verse 3 says that during the 1260 year period, the Bible was clothed in sackcloth, like Job long ago, which is a sign of mourning. Why? Because its beautiful message was rejected in favor of human traditions. John on the Isle of Patmos saw the Bible in sackcloth, humiliated because of human tradition. Napin says, Tradition, not scriptures, is the rock on which the Church of Christ is built. This comes from Catholic doctrine as defined by the Council of Trent. Unfortunately, the great Protestant scholars are following in the footsteps of Rome. It is very important to study these historical facts, but it is equally important to ask ourselves the question, am I placing tradition above the word of God? May he help us to be obedient to all his commandments. Verse 5 says, If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Now what does this mean? 
This is Wadi Kelt in Israel. The Bible tells us that ravens fed the prophet Elijah, who was a mouthpiece of God, and he drank water from the brook of Cherith. What happened to his enemies when they wanted to kill him? 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. At this the king sent to Elijah another captain with fifty men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says, Come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, May fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Now this is a serious warning telling us that we cannot lightly ignore the word of God coming from his prophets. Fire destroyed the disobedient. Will it again be repeated? Yes, it will again be repeated because this is a type of what's going to happen at the end of time. In Revelation chapter 20 verse 9 we have a very sad picture of all those who've rejected God's word. It says they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. We have a choice. We either allow the Bible to burn away the dross of our characters or be consumed by fire when God is going to cleanse his universe from all impurity. But let us read from verse 6 where John speaks of another power that the Bible possesses. Revelation 11, 6 These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Somehow chapter 11 wants to focus our attention on the life of Elijah and his message. And remember, the historic Elijah message is a type of the end-time Elijah message. We can only understand the book of Revelation if we make a thorough study of the Old Testament. James 5 verses 17 and 18 Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. God's words spoken through his prophets can prevent rain from falling on the disobedient. By the way, the genuine rain, the genuine Holy Spirit, comes from obeying the genuine prophet. The false rain, the false Holy Spirit, comes from listening to the false prophets. Let's make the Bible our only norm of faith. Revelation chapter 11 verse 6 They have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. What a powerful book! Never underestimate the power of the word of God. Let's go to the Old Testament to find out more about the time when water was turned into blood by the power of the word of God. Exodus 7 verse 19 The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. While I looked at the Nile, my thoughts went back to the time when this mighty river was turned into blood. This is how powerful God's word is. On authority of his word, water will again be turned into blood during one of the last seven plagues. When I visited Matterhorn in Switzerland, I thought of another powerful verse in Isaiah 1 verse 18 that says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Have you experienced the cleansing power of the Word of God? It is a powerful manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 4 verse 12 For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. But remember, God's word only has power in our lives when we obey it. We've also read in Revelation 11.6 that the two witnesses have got power to strike the earth with terrible plagues. 
Let's read more about this in Revelation chapter 22 verse 18. Revelation 22 verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. David prayed in Psalms 119 verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. My prayer is that his word will always receive a warm welcome in our hearts. Revelation chapter 11 verse 7 Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Here is a prediction that at the end of the 1260 year prophecy, a beast, which is a kingdom, a nation, will launch a fierce attack on God's word. His two witnesses. Does history tell us who this nation is? Yes, it does. Do you recognize this tower? It's the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The First French Republic fulfilled this prophecy. Let's study the facts of history in conjunction with the Bible. Revelation chapter 11 verse 8. Their bodies, whose bodies? The two witnesses, the Bible, will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. While you're looking at the beautiful stained glass windows of the Notre Dame in Paris, we need to answer a few questions. Why is France and its capital Paris called Sodom and Egypt? What characteristics of Sodom did France reveal at the end of the 1260 year prophecy? Sodom used to be here in the vicinity of the Dead Sea called Mapet Dra. The well-known word sodomy comes from the sinful practices of this ancient wicked city. France and its capital Paris reached their height of immorality during the end of the 18th century. And I don't think it's necessary to pollute your mind with the debasing details. The history of France at the end of the 1700s fits the description of Sodom. Does it also fit the description of Egypt? Yes. In what way is the French nation likened to Egypt? When you study Egyptology, you discover that the ancient Egyptians were atheists. Listen to Pharaoh's atheistic utterances. Exodus chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. This is called atheism. Is it possible that an entire nation like France could become atheistic, like ancient Egypt, as the Bible predicted? Yes, let us quote the historical sources. France is the only nation in the world concerning which the authentic record survives that as a nation she lifted her hand in open rebellion against the author of the universe. Plenty of blasphemers, plenty of infidels, there have been and still continue to be in England, Germany, Spain and elsewhere. But France stands apart in the world's history as the single state which, by the decree of a legislative assembly, pronounced that there was no God, and of which the entire population of the capital and a vast majority elsewhere, women as well as men, danced and sang with joy in accepting the announcement. You've just read the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 11 verse 8. Many thoughts went through my mind when I visited the Notre Dame in Paris. While I stood here, I realized that I was looking at fulfilled prophecy. Let me read you one more quotation of what happened at this cathedral. When the goddess was brought into the convention, the orator took her by the hand and turning to the assembly said, Mortals, cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a god whom your fears have created. Henceforth, acknowledge no divinity but reason. I offer you its noblest and purest image. 
If you must have idols, sacrifice only to such as this. Fall before the august senate of freedom, O veil of reason. Christ was crucified here in Paris at Notre Dame when they officially rejected his word. But for how long would this rejection continue? Let's read from Revelation chapter 11 verses 9 and 10. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on earth. When you read the history of the French Revolution, you discover that the official ban against the Bible lasted from November 1793 to June 1797, exactly three and a half years. Now isn't that amazing? You also discover from the history of France that at the close of the 18th century, the prophecy of Revelation 11 was dramatically fulfilled. Let's read it. Verses 11 and 12. But after the three and a half days, November 1793 to June 1797, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. And terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Did the Bible soar to new heights after June 1797? Yes. I took this picture in Geneva. It used to be the home of the French skeptic Voltaire. He was the man who said that a few years after his death, the Bible would be obsolete. But after his death, the Bible Society bought this specific house, his house, to distribute thousands of Bibles. The prophecy said that the two witnesses, the Bible, would ascend to heaven. The Arc de Triomphe in the Champs-Élysées in Paris commemorates Napoleon's military victories. But greater than all his victories was the victory the Bible gained at the end of the 1,260-year prophecy in France. Suddenly, millions upon millions of copies were printed in hundreds of languages, the Bible Society sprung up like mushrooms. Throughout the history of the Bible, its enemies tried to destroy it. But no one in the entire world could ever do it or would ever succeed in destroying it. The serious warning comes to you and me not to try and destroy the Bible through our own stubborn disobedience, but to uphold it by prayerful obedience. Revelation chapter 11 verse 13 At that very hour there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Do you recognize this machine? It's called the guillotine. Time does not allow us to look at the tremors that the French Revolution caused all over the world. I'm just quoting one historian. Professor Palmer in his book, The Age of Democratic Revolution, page 7, says something very interesting. He describes the era of the French Revolution as an earthquake. Jean the Revelator and Professor Palmer couldn't use a more descriptive word. Verses 14 and 15. The second woe is past. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 16 and 17 And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. 
Verse 19, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. We've looked at the first half of the book of Revelation. From now on, we'll be looking at the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Who is the woman of Revelation 12? Who is the dragon? It is very important to know who the first beast of Revelation 13 is. He has a number, an image, and a mark. But chapter 13 also speaks of a second beast that will be one of the superpowers at the end of time. Who is he? Please don't miss the next few lectures on the end time events just before Jesus comes to take us home. By neglecting the study of the book of Revelation, we may just be lost forever. But by studying these prophecies, we are preparing for that glorious day of his appearing. Thank you, Francois. Dear listener, I trust you found the lecture informative and interesting. Let us pray. Dear Lord, together with the psalmist, we want to say, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thank you for guiding us through this life to that glorious day when we will meet the great author, Jesus, personally. Amen.